Thank you, Brother Billy. I appreciate that. And it was short and sweet, and thank you very much. I especially like the sweet part. Um, good, good to have all of you here, and, and thank you uh, for the, to the committee and, and guys on the faculty here for inviting me to, to speak at uh, the, uh, the program here. And uh, my only criticism is that you put me at the same time with Victor Escu. And uh, I love to hear Victor uh, preaching and, and all of that, so I'm going to miss out on him today and uh, but so glad so glad that you're here hope you got your nap in this afternoon or at least during the last lecture I hope you got your nap in anyway but so glad that you are here today and and we're going to talk about uh, parenting a little bit uh, for these next couple of minutes uh, while when you hear the Apostle Paul say this that the spirit and disposition of which is found elsewhere in the scriptures Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God, uh, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 31, then you immediately know, because you know Paul, that the phrase, whatever you do, involves a lot of things. Arguably, nothing is left out. And certainly this involves our most intimate human relationships and obligations, one of which is parenting for those whom God has blessed to be married and marriages that have been blessed by God with precious children. Now, quite obviously, not all children come into the world by means of the sanctity of marriage. But no matter what, and this needs to be said, I think, in this culture of death and throw away humanity, all children without exception deserve the best fathering and mothering they can get. They deserve fathers and mothers who desire most of all to bring glory to God. After 34 years of marriage, three children and three grandchildren later, I am now ready to concede that I am no expert at rearing children. You Maybe you've heard this story before, uh, so uh, I'm sorry for repeating it. I'm reminded of the graduate student who gave a lecture one time called The Ten Commandments for Parents. The lecture was well-researched, it was well-attended, and the young man laid out uh, all of his points in a very masterful way. Well, he got married, and he became a father, and so he had to alter his lecture a little bit to ten hints for parents. And then after a second child arrived, he changed the lecture again to a few suggestions for parents. And after the third child was born, he stopped lecturing. <laughs> Although I'm no expert, I happily admit that my wife Beth, who carried each of our children for nine months and went through the stresses and strains of childbirth, no small feat, who homeschooled our children and grounded them firmly in the scriptures, is as much an expert on parroting as anyone I know. We have three adult children. Uh, all of them are faithfully in the church and serving him faithfully, serving the Lord. And uh, she had much more to do with that outcome than I did. I, I, I'm telling you the truth. I'm happy, very happy to sing her praises. I have a great model a model to back me up, her model to back me up this afternoon, but better still, I have the Word of God. Not meaning to insult your intelligence in any way, but I want to make a point by asking this question. What does it mean to be a parent? The term parent derives from a Latin word that means to bring forth. To be a parent then, whether you're a man or a woman, is to possess the biological power needed to reproduce. The question is, is parenting more than just biology? Someone once said, I don't remember who said it, someone said people are not snails or grasshoppers or chimpanzees. They are distinctly molded after God's own image. Since people are spiritual and moral beings, then we are right to suspect that parenting is much, much more than biology. I was speaking to a college student not too long ago, and uh, she asked me this question. Since people came from apes, is it possible for a person and a monkey to have a baby together? 
That question, I promise you, was asked in all seriousness. To her, it logically follows. If apes and people came from the same thing biologically, then it really is a reasonable question. Why couldn't we just manipulate the biology, the the genetic code a little bit in our laboratories and just make it happen? Of course, we do not grant the assumption of naturalism. A human being and an animal cannot have a baby together for the simple reason that human beings are uniquely made in the image of God, according to Genesis 1, 26 through 28. Actually, we are spiritual beings even more than we are physical beings, which makes us uniquely answerable to God for our thoughts and our behavior and our words and our choices, according to 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. The fact that we are made in the divine image means that we are accountable to God for our roles as parents At its best, parenthood arises out of a lifelong spiritual covenant that we call marriage. In Genesis 1, 26 through 28, God linked parenthood not only to marriage, but to the fact that we are fashioned in his likeness. This singular fact makes parenting a spiritual undertaking. I'm afraid that if we bypass this divine arrangement, that is, the spiritual link between human identity and marriage and parenting, the result is going to be destruction for ourselves and for our families in eternity. Not only culturally but, and in society, but in eternity. A child coming into the world should be welcomed, ideally welcomed as a spiritual blessing, according to Psalm 127 in verse 3. A child should not be seen as a burden or as an unforeseen consequence of sin. No, never. A child should be the offspring of a man and woman who have prayed to the Lord and love the Lord deeply. What a serious responsibility it is to be a parent. There is no greater task, I don't believe, as as great as I think preaching is. I think a far greater task is that of being a parent. Is it not telling that God expects us to look at the parental skills of men who would be appointed as elders. Church leadership derives from parenting. First of all, from the man who would be appointed to be an elder and his wife. Ideally, they should come from very skilled and godly and righteous parenting. And then, of course, they ought to display those very same skills and righteousness and holiness in their own parenting. When the Apostle Paul wrote to his spiritual children in Corinth, he said this, in 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 14, Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours, but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. The words lay up come from a Greek word that means to to lay by and store, to store up, to store as in storing a treasure, keeping a, a treasure in store. Paul was speaking of what is common practice in families then, 2,000 years ago, and even today. Parents have the responsibility to lay up certain things for their children. Our first business, our first order of business as parents is to minister to our children. Not to think of it as our children ministering to us, but first and foremost, us ministering to our children. Parenting is ministry, and ministry is service to God and service to others, and in this case, to our children. Most of us understand 
that we are to provide food and clothing and shelter and protection and health care and education for our children. I think this is the meaning of Paul to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8. All of these things are considered the essentials of parenting, even by many, many parents in the world. But in studying the Bible, these things are largely assumed on the basis of self-preservation and family love. According to the Bible, other things are of higher value. God and man and woman cooperated together to bring into being a brand new life, a living soul that never existed before. And now this life will continue into eternity. What an awesome realization. This child will grow into an accountable human being. Spend a few years, a few short years of life on this earth. And then there will be a vast eternity that he or she will inherit. And there's no going back. No going back, no putting that baby back in the womb, you know, as Nicodemus once suggested. Can, can, can a baby, can, can a man return to his mother's womb? No, John chapter 3, no. That cannot be, there's no going back. I cannot imagine a greater motivation for exceptional parenting that brings glory to God than the motive of the eternal soul. No surprise that Paul gave us these instructions that you're all familiar with, Ephesians 6 and verse 4, and you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. So here it is, your great responsibility as a parent is to minister to your children the things that are most needful for the soul. Whatever you do, don't fail here. So love those children and have a vision of eternity for the glory of God. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. This is the purity that we're talking about. This is the pure motive that covers everything. So now we come to this. What do our children need in view of eternity and in view of God's glory? Eternity and the glory of God are intertwined as our focus in parenting. Paul once spoke of a debt. You remember the, the debt he owed to the lost as a result of his salvation and divine calling. Romans 1 and verse 14. If God made you a parent, then you have a debt to pay to God and your children are due the installments. What do our children need in view of eternity and in view of God's glory? We can answer this question with a perfect seven response. But before we explore these ideas, allow me to preface this study with just one major idea. We began, Beth and I, began our child rearing responsibilities with this thought in mind. Whatever children need, whatever they need, they need it early. They need it early in their lives. Earlier is almost, in almost every situation, early is almost always better than, than later. I know people like to say as a kind of excuse, better late than never. But when it comes to parenting, late is only slightly better than never. Who wants to be slightly better than never when it comes to parenting? You can wait too late to be the parent God is calling you to be. You can wait too late. Begin now. Begin immediately. Sooner is better than later, according to Proverbs 8 and verse 17. Parenting to the glory of God, this purity of all motivations, means the following. These points you'll find in the lectureship book. Children need love. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's just too little of, right? Right? You know the words of that song. It was released in 1965, and it has become, even now, it even now is a kind of anthem of a postmodern generation. 
Sentiment is quite wonderful. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's, it's true. Who can argue with that? We, we need more love in the world. But the statement is actually practically useless because it lacks definition and substance. Our children don't need things in their lives that lack definition, especially love. If love is what motivated God to send His Son into the world to save the world, then our children need to know the value of love. They need to know the power of love. Christian parents, parents of the Word and of the Lord, are in the very best position to define and demonstrate love because they understand and appreciate that perfect love that has already been defined for us all in the death of Christ for sinners, Romans 5 and verse 8. You see, at, at its very best, when parenting is at its best, then that becomes the very best program, the very best means that God has on this earth to raise the next generation of, of human beings. The Bible is essentially a book about love. We need to see the Bible in that way. That it's a love book. It's a book about love, about God's love for us and God's interest in our lives be, because of His love and God's interest in our souls because of His love. God's Word informs us that love is the highest response of man to God. As Jesus himself said when he was quoting from Deuteronomy 6 verse 5, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, Matthew 22, 37 and 38. Let the godly love of the Bible be the guiding light in your marriage and in your home. Love is expressed, that love is expressed in three ways. First of all, love for God, which is a love that is expressed in our obedience to him according to Jesus in John 14 and verse 15. Secondly, love for others. We display this love by meeting needs and showing hospitality and in being interested in souls, Romans 13 verse 8 and Philippians 2 verses 1 through 11. And thirdly, love for one another in the close confines of the home environment, Colossians chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. When, I, when we were raising our children, I, I found just so many different ways, so many different ways to, to show your love for your kids. I'm going to do something a little bit unusual here. You've never seen a preacher do this before, okay? A sock, okay? How do you like that? Don't that look silly? Doesn't that look silly? We have so many home pictures of me wearing a sock on my ears, and sometimes two socks on my ears. It just looks absolutely ridiculous. But from a child's point of view, who's three or four or five or six or seven years old, and you're down there on the floor playing with them, and you're, putting their, you're taking their socks off, and you're putting them on your ears, and then you're chasing them around the house, you're making connections. You're building a relationship with your children in those things that when they get older, they'll listen to your advice and they'll listen to your instruction. How many times did we build, you just, I just bought wooden blocks or cardboard blocks and we would just build them and build and build and build and have all kinds of fun just with with blocks. One time when I remember I was working outside, not too very long, but I was just wearing kind of my old t-shirt and my old blue jeans and all of that, and I came inside. I hadn't been doing anything sweaty, so everybody relax, but I, I, I came into the living room, and, and the kids were kind of playing there, and I just got down there and started playing with them a little bit and wrestling with, wrestled with my kids all the time. That's just, that's just fun to do that. And I remember taking one of the kids' hands, I think it was Benjamin, I think that uh, we just had two kids at the time and we were wrestling and I just took one of his hands and I, and I just caused him to, to kind of tear my shirt and I kind of reacted to that like what are you doing you know what are you doing what do you mean tearing my shirt and he didn't know exactly what to do about that but we continued to wrestle and then he he tore my shirt again and then my pants and it wasn't very long I was almost stripped naked by my two kids just thought that that was the funnest thing in the world 
to pull my, 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 uh, my clothes apart like that. Those are just things that you got to do with your kids to show that you're interested in them and that you love them. Parenting is a serious matter. Families are disintegrating before our very eyes in this ungodly world. This is where the failure is occurring. Fathers and mothers are failing to place a premium on love in the home as it is defined by God. It is, said, it is sad that, the, that we are destroying the family. We are destroying the family and we are destroying our nation and we are corrupting our culture every time we allow our relationships not to be builded and are built and grounded on the principle of love. Remember, Paul commanded parents, Titus 2 and verse 4, love your children. Love your children. Children need to be loved and we need to obey God. This is the basic need of any child. You cannot glorify God in your life without doing this. Without, without giving the love, love to your children. Children need direction. I think this is where love is going to take you as a parent. Love supplies that essential need. Many years ago, the prophet Micah said to God's people, He has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Micah 6 and verse 8. All of us need that, of course. After all, there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Proverbs 14 and verse 12. If you don't want your children to go in the way of death, none of us do, then you better, you better give them the direction that they need for life. Speaking of direction, you can't really talk about direction without thinking about authority. Parents are a child's first experience with authority. We need to make it good. We need to make it good. We would do well to look at God Himself as the perfect model. He displays His love for us in the exercise of His authority by commanding us to do those things that are good for us. And of course, He forbids us to do those things that are harmful to us. In view of His authority, what does He require? We are to humble ourselves before Him and obey Him. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care for him, all your care on him, for he cares for you, 1 Peter 5, 6 and 7. God expects us to exercise parental authority and direction in love in order to point our children in the direction of heaven. Ephesians 6 and verse 4. Sometimes the exercise of our authority involves corrective discipline, chastening, Hebrews 12 and verse 7, but only after direction has been understood by the child and only for the purpose of giving direction, I believe. Correction should not ever be used as a relief valve for our frustration. In most cases, correction should not be exercised simply because it is deserved, but as a way to give further instruction and direction. Remember as a parent, the goal is not justice. So we're not really talking so much about punishment. It's not justice. The goal is redemption and direction. The effects of doing this deliberately and in the right way will bring untold positive results. It will affect your family for generations to come. I don't know who said it, but, but it rings true. Spoil your children and raise your grandchildren Raise your children and spoil your grandchildren. In this matter of direction, we are teaching our children a valuable lesson. We're teaching them to respond to legitimate authority with humility and respect. Your children need this lesson because you are preparing them to serve God and to live with Him in eternity. The blessing is that you will live with your children in glory. I, I, I want to live with my children in glory. I want to go with them. I want to be with them in heaven. Children need to know what it means to be responsible. Being responsible is about acknowledging that they have been entrusted with something valuable. And you need to put this in their minds early. That their bodies, 
that their minds, their hearts, their emotions are valuable, their souls are valuable, and that what is required is faithfulness to that trust. Being responsible is about meeting one's obligations, so that means it's about character, it's about integrity. Paul had it right, moreover it is required in stewards that one be found faithful, 1 Corinthians 4 verse 2. God wants our, your children, to grow up and take their place in society, whether as farmers or teachers or investors or doctors or construction workers or citizens, but always as faithful servants of God. Paul was entrusted with preaching the gospel. You remember, he was entrusted with preaching the gospel to Jews and Gentiles and planting churches in a sinful world. As parents, we have been entrusted with a, with, a, with a stewardship that is just as certain and just as defined. By word and by example, we must instruct and encourage our children to think of their lives as a stewardship towards the God of heaven. They are stewards of their relationships, of their families, of their bodies, and of their souls, and of their time. So the apostle wrote in 1 Timothy 4 verse 12 to young Timothy, let no one despise your youth, but be an example of the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Paul was reminding Timothy about responsible stewardship. Let's do that with our children every day. Remind them of responsible stewardship. Children need wisdom. Wisdom is the one thing that is most needed Proverbs 23, 23, buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. This is just another way of saying you need to teach your children to be smart. Okay? Teach your children how to be smart. How many times is it said in the wisdom literature of Scripture, my son, give me your heart. Give heed to my words. Keep my words. Listen to instruction. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. Proverbs 4 and verse 7. No one, no one should aspire to be a parent who is not seeking wisdom themselves. Children will make mistakes. They will make poor choices. They will commit sin. They will commit sin while they're living at home. They will do that. Teach them how to deal with that. Teach them how to deal with that failure. Think of the wisdom of the wayward son in Luke chapter 15. The wisdom to repent. The wisdom to go back home. And the wisdom to confess all. And how he was received with open arms by his father, his parent. One of the most important things you can pass on to your children is the ability to think, to reason correctly, to weigh their options, and to consider the consequences of their choices before those choices are made. And then teach them this, the human heart is capable of no greater foolishness than to think that life will never end and that God will never call us to account for our decisions and for our actions. Wisdom and responsibility and obedience to God and pursuing the glory of God, all of these go hand in hand. Jesus said, you may recall in Luke 21, verse 34, and take heed to yourselves, lest any of you, lest any, at any time, your hearts be overcharged with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. What day is this? Obviously, it is the day that the soul goes to meet the Lord in judgment. That day is coming. It's coming for all of us. Teach your children that that day is coming. So teach them to be wise and to be prepared. Children need the church. Your children need to know that the church is as much, uh, that they need the church as much as they need God himself. Because you cannot separate in God's plan. You cannot separate his plan for the church and himself as God. Our children more than ever need to know about the church that Jesus loved and died for, Ephesians 5.23, the church that he promises to embrace and bless for all of eternity, 1 Thessalonians 4.17. So you take them to church. 
You take them to church how often? As often as the church meets. I mean, what else am I going to say, okay? Uh, just every once in a while, you know, every now and then. Of course not. Of course not. Not if we're to seek the kingdom of God first. Show them that the church is valuable to you. Someday your children are going to be out on their own. And when that time comes, what are they going to do with the church? And you need to show them that you value the church, even with, its, with its, the weaknesses of its personalities. Because that's what's going to discourage them. If anything's, going, if anything's going to discourage them, it's going to be the weaknesses of those personalities that they experience in the church. And you need to teach them how to hang on how to hang on and how to see it through. The Bible specifically tells us, so it's unequivocal, that the church belongs to God, Acts 20 and verse 28. But there is a sense, a biblical sense, in which the church belongs to us and to our children. In Revelation 2 and 3, those two chapters, Jesus made it quite clear that the members of the seven churches of Asia were responsible for the health of those churches. Whether those churches survived or died depended on the commitment of those believers. We need to impress on our children that God expects them to take ownership of the local church, to love it, to support it, to encourage it, to heal it when things go wrong, to pray for it. Each local church is what we make of it. God has a plan for his church and your children are a part of that plan. Growth occurs, as you very well know, when the church is joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. I think of young families, children, when I think of that. Every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So parents, you need to fulfill that role. Two more points. Children need to pursue holiness and reject worldliness. This is their hope for the future. Because if we're not holy, if we're not sanctified before the Lord, we will not see God. The temptations of the world are so great that they will not be resisted unless children pursue the holiness of the Lord from their hearts. From their hearts. For all of the good the internet is, social media and access to information has largely exacerbated the problem of temptation and sin. Satan has transformed himself into an angel of light. And I think, oh, how appropriate to say it in that way by the glow of a smartphone. And that angel of light, okay? And how often Satan is behind that glow. The temptation to engage in sex before marriage, to lie to parents and teachers, to be entertained by performers and actors who promote sin and ridicule what is godly. All of these represent great challenges to parents and children. We need to fight for our children. We need to fight for them to the death. We need to show them by our examples that the way to make the most of life is to pursue what is good and to reject what is evil. We can equip them to overcome these pressures by daily talks with them talking to them. I remember so much. I remember when, that, when, that when we had our children and she was, uh, and, and my wife had them up there on top of the changing table. So they're still in diapers, okay? And I remember my wife talking to my son about the importance of marrying a Christian. Okay? She was talking to him. Now, you're going to grow up and marry a Christian, aren't you? You know? Just those little talks. And it wasn't just when he was a baby or she was a baby. It was it was throughout their time with us in their home. And so we would talk about those things, those important things. This can be done. All of this fighting for our children and for our families, it can be done even in these times that try men's souls. In 1 Peter chapter 1, in verse 15, it is written, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Paul exhorts us, abhor that which is evil, cling to that which is good. Romans 12 and verse 9. This is what we need to pass on to our children. The impulse to desire God's will and the tools to discern good from evil. Hebrews 5 verses 12 through 14. And one more point. Children need to know the way to heaven. They need to know the way to heaven. All of us need to know the way to heaven, of course. 
The way to heaven can be known, and those who know it are responsible for telling it to others. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. So God, God blesses you with children. You, you have to pass on the word to them. And you got to do this. You got to teach your children how to pass it on to others. You got to teach your children how to be missionaries, how to be evangelists, how to teach and preach the gospel. The way of heaven is through Christ and only through Christ, John 14 and verse 6, by means of the gospel, Romans 1 and verse 16. There's no other way but this. So, that means we're going to keep on teaching our children about faith and about repentance and about confession and about baptism. We're going to keep talking to them about faithfulness and we're going to keep talking to them about the family of God. We live in an age of spiritual uncertainty for so many people. So many have lost their way. Atheism and unbelief have launched an aggressive assault on our faith. Religious pluralism, the view that all religions are equally plausible, seem to be, that seems to be the only show in town these days. Secularism is fast becoming the dominant worldview in Western culture and in America's hometowns. Those who stand with God and with truth are viewed as intolerant and narrow. The best thing we can do for our children in this environment, even though it will, it will cost them, okay? It will cost them. In fact, do not call your children to a faith that is not costly. Tell them that it is going to cost them. Prepare them for it. The best thing that we can do for our children is point them to a faith they can be certain about and a faith that will help them reach heaven. Everyone faces death with fear and apprehension, according to Hebrews 2 and verse 15. We're not deluding ourselves, are we? And I'm talking to parents. We're not deluding ourselves that our children are not destined to die someday, are we? We're not telling ourselves that. I know it's great when we go to the hospital and we have a brand new baby and it's wonderful to walk our daughter down the aisle and, and all of that, but in all of those happy times, we're not telling ourselves a lie, are we? That our children are not destined to die because they are. Let's give our children that with which they can face death with confidence and joy and expectation. Why would we want to give our children this greatest of all gifts why would we not want to do that? It's greatest of all gifts because of Christ and what he's done for us. So much is at stake in the rearing of our children. Their souls and ours are in the balance. By providing your children what they need, think of all you get in return. The assurance that you and your children are going to heaven and the assurance that you are pleasing the one who made it all possible. To God be the glory, great things he has done. Indeed, great things he has done. Brother Billy, I am finished. And thank you all very much for being here in this lecture. I hope it was helpful for you in some way. Thank you.